We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. The end of World War II coincided with the eruption of social revolutions and national liberation movements all over Asia, in China, in Vietnam, in Korea, in India, in Indonesia, and in other parts of the colonized world. It also led to the creation of a new global anti-imperialist women's movement, a wave of radical feminism that has largely been ignored or forgotten. Welcome to The Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. If you enjoy or rely on this show, please show your support by becoming a patron, by subscribing at patreon.com forward slash The Socialist Program. Today, we're talking with Dr. Lisa Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong is a professor and department chair of the study of women and gender at Smith College, and she is an author her most recent book, just released on International Women's Day this year, is called Bury the Corpse of Colonialism, the Revolutionary Feminist Conference of 1949. Dr. Armstrong, welcome to the Socialist Program. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, I'm going to recommend to all of the people watching this show or listening to this show, go out and buy this book. This is Bury the Corpse of colonialism, the Revolutionary Feminist Conference of 1949. I, even the first couple pages, Dr. Armstrong, are amazing writing. It draws the reader in. Uh, people who buy this book will continue to read it. They'll share it with their friends. Uh, do that. But what makes this conference and this project, the project that you worked so many years on, so interesting, is that it coincides with this new the new world, really, the post-World War II world, where social revolution is on the agenda. Of course, the People's Republic of China has its revolution and it's victorious one month, about six weeks before this conference takes place. But there's the revolution in, in, in Vietnam, in Korea, in Indonesia, in India, throughout the Middle East, throughout Africa. I mean, this was both a new era of imperialism, but also a new era of revolution. Let's just put this conference first before we get into the project itself, before the conference itself, what that period was like, and who were the women uh, who were the leaders of it, many of whose names we don't know. We know the names of some of the men, not enough, but we know, we know the names of almost none of the women. But let's just sort of paint the picture of what that period was like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we don't know these women's names, and they were all communists. They were all revolutionary activists. They were coming out of the movements of their locations, and this was that moment where they were meeting with each other. So this is a time when um, communist movements are growing to a large degree invisibly to, to the kind of Euro-American eye. They were growing in the face of induced famines that were across the globe, the colonized world. So North Africa in the early 1940s, right through the mid-1940s, were seeing these massive famines that were produced by the French colonial officials who were carting off the food that was being grown in Northern Africa to the battlefronts, what they considered the battlefronts in Europe. Same was happening in South Asia. So this is a moment when that um, realization, that refusal of colonial usurpation of the ability to live was absolutely on the forefront. So if we go into the early 19, the later 1940s, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing in 1948 was a incredible year for revolutionary movements in Indonesia, in Vietnam, um, the, there was an overflow, even in India, where they had gained independence from the British, 
they had not gained independence from landlords and feudalism, from the um, sort of local bourgeoisie of the Indian elite. So there were revolutions across the world. And this is the context for this conference. And women were right there in the middle of all of it, whether it was uh, fighting or supplying the troops or organizing the people. These were women who we have literally lost to history. Yeah, this is a, a project that you spent many years uh, researching and writing. It's kind of a buried history. We're talking about burying the corpse of colonialism. <laughs> but a big part of this story is how the conference itself becomes buried. And so people think about different trends in, or waves or stages of feminism. We're, we frequently talk about feminism as waves, wave one, wave two, wave three. Uh, rarely is it talked about that feminism or the women's rights movement was led by communists and socialists. And that's frequently also the case in the, for the black civil rights movement in the United mm -hmm. States. Before mm -hmm. Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 and before the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, there was a massive struggle for uh, black freedom and equality in the United States, led by communists, largely a, a forgotten history. And we're going to go. Why, we're going to talk with you about why this history, in the case of the women's conference, become became sort of forgotten. But I also want to just also contextualize the conference that it took place in China, and I want you to talk about that a little bit because China. It's kind of remarkable that China could actually host a conference like this. <laughs> the, the Communist Party comes to power in, on October 1st, 1949, officially. Chairman Mao sp stands up at uh, Tiananmen Square and says that ch the people of China have stood up, meaning they're proclaiming a new era. Uh, right after that, Mao goes to spend months in the Soviet Union to meet with Stalin to talk about the building of a, a China-Soviet friendship tre uh, treaty. We're right on the eve of the Korean War. That happened six months later. And yet, like within weeks, China hosts this conference. Let's talk about that and why China did it and the significance, because obviously the Chinese women's organizations were also the co-host. Yes. And so let's, if we can walk back a couple of years, in 1945 is the founding of the Women's International Democratic Federation. So that was the larger internationalist organization that, that hosted alongside the All China Democratic Women's Union, hosted the conference in Beijing. And if you look, even in 1945, there's, there's a presence, a very marked presence of um, Chinese women at that conference going to Europe, making those contacts, spending time, months in, in India um, to, to work with the comrades there. So the investment and the, 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 um, the care that the Chinese government spent developing these linkages are longstanding. So what had originally happened is the conference was supposed to be held in 1948. Um, Nehru in India said, no chance, you can't hold it in Calcutta, um, and absolutely refused visas to everyone. Um, and so then there was some talk of maybe hosting in Indonesia, but due to the revolutionary and the, um, uh, the fighting in Indonesia, it wasn't able to happen there. And as soon as it became clear, this was probably around August of 1949, it was clear that, that there would be the capacity to host this conference, the um, Chinese delegation made the invitation. So this was the second international conference held in the People's Republic of China. The first one was the World Trade Union. Uh, Congress. So this was absolutely at the forefront of their thinking. It wasn't an afterthought. This was something they took very, very seriously. And one of the co-sponsoring groups was the Women's International Democratic Federation, WIDF. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, if, you, if people go to the Wikipedia, not that I'm recommending Wikipedia <laughs> for people to do their research, but if one happens to go there, there is an entry and it talks about how the American component of, or the American wing of that organization, the WIDF, is basically suppressed uh, as an anti-communist, as a, by anti-communism, by the House of Un-American Activities Committee. It shut down in 1949, uh, or condemned in 1949, maybe not shut down. But that's at the same time as the Smith Act trials are taking place. Mm -hmm. 
And so you have Ben Davis. I'm in New York City. He's an African-American city council member. He goes to prison for uh, sedition, as do other leaders of the Communist Party, sent to prison not for something they did, but for, for who they are, for what they thought, for what they believed in. The mm -hmm. prosecutor even cited the Communist Manifesto when he couldn't get yes. them on. He was trying to say, well, you, you advocate violence. And they were like, no, we don't. We, we don't. We have a different strategy. And they, he said, but you read the Communist Manifesto and you like that, right? And doesn't Marx talk about the forcible overthrow of existing society? And so they're convicted for what they think. So mm -hmm. part of this story, and one of the reasons I think this book is so important, is that like the Korean War became the forgotten war because of the witch hunt, mm -hmm. This wave of feminism led by Marxists and communists and socialist women in the national liberation movements and that was thoroughly anti-imperialist has also been forgotten because it was suppressed. Again, exactly. an important part of the context for your book. That's exactly right. This was not an accidental forgetting. This wasn't a, an oversight. What we lose and what we have lost until, until the work of a number of scholars is are uncovering these histories. But what we have lost is our own knowledge of our own history. So the only way you can have a notion of waves is to imagine that this whole period did not exist, that there wasn't leadership coming from communist women around the world, particularly on the question of human rights internationally by communist women in the what was later in 1955 called the third world in the locations of the world colonized by Europe. And that kind of leadership to suppress the leadership of it, precisely these women, there's, it's impossible to imagine that it's an accident. Their revolutionary fervor, their ability to organize people that previously had been called unorganizable. They're organizing peasant women, rural women, Adivasi women, indigenous women from their regions. They're, they're making sure that the organization, when we're fighting for socialism, fighting for communism, has not said that at some later date, we will address questions of women's liberation. In fact, it's impossible to put it off that, that the two are synonymous, that socialism is about the um, end of colonialism, end of uh, patriarchy, end of feudalism, and they make they tie these together in their leadership and in their theories for social change and in who they organize. Yeah, you know, it's so it's so interesting how the debates of today, the controversies of today, of today, are framed because there's a frequently a question asked. For instance, what's more important, class or race, class or gender? And you can keep going down the litany of the different yeah. manifestations of oppression in contemporary society. And so the, the, the sort of caricature, the false stereotyping of a Marxist approach towards this question is Marxists believe that the, the, all of uh, earlier history in our continued contemporary society is dominated by the class struggle, and that means class takes precedence over every other manifestation of oppression. And what you're saying and what the thesis of this conference was that the oppression of women was completely bound up with the struggle for col against colonialism, against imperialism, and against mm -hmm. class oppression, meaning there's not really a separation. It's a false dichotomy to talk about race or gender versus class. It's part of and perhaps central to the class struggle. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying is incredibly important to underscore, which is if we lose our history, if we lose the complexity of thinking from, in this case, the mid 20th century, it could be even the early 20th century. But at this moment right now, if we lose the complexity of this thinking, it makes it possible for these false stereotypes to seem even probable or possible. It, there wasn't a single there were many debates that were happening on the floor of this conference, and you've already hinted at one of them, but there was not a single moment where any of the delegates uh, tried to make uh, more important one capacity of 
the people's oppression more important than another. To ask the question of class oppression was to ask the question of imperialism. The struggle against imperialism demanded an attention to Jim Crow segregation in the United States, as well as um, colonial oppression on the basis of these eugenicist racial theories of notions of what woman's place is in these locations and the weaponization of what these feudal ideologies around gender and patriarchy were. So the, the question became, how do we dismantle colonialism and imperialism? And the answers lay from that question. And to simplify or to weigh out or to piece of the pie it in this a deeply capitalist way to say one thing is more important than the other, it wouldn't have made any sense. It wouldn't have even, it never came up. When we think about going to a conference, Dr. Armstrong, people think, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to a conference. That means <laughs> I'll have a few days away from the kids or away from work. It's going to be, I'll be at a hotel. Um, I'll see c colleagues at Maybe it'll be kind of a good time even. Uh, these women risk their lives to come to this conference. Let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So there was a large delegation that came from Korea. Again, it's coming across battlefields, but it was over 80 women came from Korea. Another large delegation, maybe more uh, around 40 women came from Moscow, where they the WIDF had just held a, a meeting. Um, but there were many women who were coming from across um, Asia, from Malaya, from, um, from Indonesia, from Vietnam, uh, where they were walking. They were on their feet. They were not able to take other forms of transport. So that crossing of the border from the southern and the southeast parts of Asia into China was incredibly fraught. And so there was one delegation from Vietnam. They were coming from North Vietnam. Of course, as we know, at this point, Vietnam is entirely occupied by France. And yet there was this autonomous zone in northern Korea that was held by the communists. So a delegation of five were supposed to go. One person who was going to help organize the conference um, left six months before the conference was supposed to begin. In the planning stages, they thought she'd be there maybe four months before the conference started and was going to do the, the preparation work. Um, she was stopped at the border. This is Hoti Min was her name. Um, um, was stopped at the border twice by the French um, and ultimately took a boat to Paris. And uh, yes, there's Houthi Minh right there. Um, took a boat to Paris um, and uh, and a ship then to Beijing. So it, she got there two days before the conference started, was not able to help with the preparations, but was able to attend and gave several speeches, represented her comrades who, were, who arrived at the conference having walked up the coast of China um, um, managed to cross the border and got there uh, around two weeks late. Amazing. Let's talk about some of the other women, if we could. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think an important person, you've already mentioned the Korean War, which broke out in six months. An important person to talk about is Pak Chung Ai. So Pak Chung Ai was a peasant woman who um, was born in the northern reaches of um, Korea. She's also um, probably the... Um, the she's a woman in from uh, what is now North Korea who held the highest position in the Communist Party. Um, she attended this conference and demanded um, a solidarity, an international solidarity for a war that she was predicting at this conference. So this is like like we've talked about in December of 1949. She said, "This is what's happening. Here's where we're going," and the the development of this strategy around the language of peace was happening in this conference. And it started to take its, uh, gain its legs over the course of the 50, uh, 1950s, 51, 52. Um, and it became a way to um, undermine the anti-communism in Europe that was taking hold and in the US where it was particularly intense. And um, the, the, the language of peace was developed here in order to preempt and respond to um, imperial aggression as war. So rather than see this about the bad actor and the U.S. had to stand in, what, what Pak Chang Ai was demanding was a, a, an analysis of war being the, 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 a necessity for capitalism, for imperialist capitalism, that it was coming not because of anything that anyone had done, but merely because Korea was demanding full independence from uh, U.S. aggression. 
Um, and so she was a really important figure. She was an important figure in the Communist Party in Korea, as I said, but also in the Women's International Democratic Federation. So she was quiet um, and persistent. And so she's someone at the conference who played a really important role. And they were ready. It's, it's terrible to say that 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 they knew the war was coming, couldn't stop it, but they were ready when it came. They had a analysis of solidarity that said, if you are from the United States, you are on the front lines of this war. Yes, the bombs are dropping in Korea, but it's precisely because the US government is dropping those bombs. It is the US, it's the American women who have to step up to the front. Um, and that's that was something that came out of this conference. Eslanda Robeson was one of the members, and she talks about this a lot. Like, what does it mean to both fight Jim Crow in um, in North America, in the U.S., as well as fight U.S. imperialism abroad? And making those linkages between um, American segregation and systemic racism and American imperialism and the refusal to allow Korea to gain into full independence. So that's another person. And there were representatives from from Africa. I, I know yes. Cote d'Ivoire, yeah. uh, the Ivory Coast, uh, an amazing story there. That's, let's talk a little bit about that sure. and then we'll keep going here. Yeah. So um, uh, Celestine Kulebali was, and this is the, the, the aspect of this story that surprised me is how many of these women, not simply, they were not simply communists, they were founders of communist parties. So when we have lost their names, we have lost the, the names of founders of the communist parties in their countries. So there was Giselle Rabasahala from Madagascar, who was one of the founders of the communist party in Madagascar and remained in public life right through the 80s. Another person, Celestine uh, um, Kulebali, she went by Mikuku. She was coming from Ivory Coast, but had grown up in Upper Volta um, and was, again, remained in public life right through the 1970s. Um, who else was from? Th those were two key thinkers. And then North Africa, there was um, one leader, Bea Alushishe from, uh, from Algeria, and she also played a long role in the history of independence movements in Algeria. So we so often think of that starting in 1954. It, the, the roots of these independence movements and the roots of these communist parties that allowed the independence movements to take, to take hold, um, we're all here. These were, these were people who were guiding the destinies of their countries. I want to talk with you, Dr. Armstrong, about what the conference actually accomplished. What did, it, what did it say its goals were? What, what came out of the con conference? Because part of the story is that the conference happened, that it happened in 1949, that it happened in China, that women had to like come walking through battlefields and risking their lives just to come to a conference. I mean, just, I want people to really wrap their head about it. These, around it, the, these were women who actually came long distances by foot risking their lives in war zones to attend a conference. That means they put a lot of importance on getting there, right? You're mm -hmm. risking your life to get there. But there's also, what did they achieve when they got there? Because Congresses aren't just like events. There are resolutions that are passed. There are declarations. There are strategies and tactics of their action-oriented conferences. They mm -hmm. are adopted. And one of the things in your book, again, the book is Bury the Corpse of Colonialism, the Revolutionary Feminist Conference of 1949. One of the points that you make is that they actually had a developed, highly refined strategy that linked women's oppression and the struggle for the eradication of oppression and the liberation of women with the struggle against colonialism and imperialism and that there was a recognition that women who were, say, in North Vietnam fighting against French colonialism and then, of course, later U.S. occupation, that was going to be a different sort of role that they were compelled to play than the women who were in France or in the United States, inside the imperialist powers. And they had a highly refined, like, inside-outside, two-pronged strategy. Talk about that. I want to go over that first, like what did they decide? And then I want to talk about why we didn't actually learn about it. I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. Mm 
why some of those declarations sort of vanished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was the mystery that compelled me, I have to admit, as I was going through this. That's what I was trying to figure out. So I, let me start with the first question, which is absolutely, they came to this conference to talk to each other. So what was happening after world, the, what we think of as the end of World War II in 1945 was um, imperialist powers were gearing up for another fight. So at this very moment, the British are helping the French, who are helping the Dutch, who are the Americans are in there. Even at this conference, the Americans were strafing Shanghai. So this is after the formation of the PRC, which the United States and all of Europe did not recognize. Um, they're still uh, flying planes over mainland China and dropping bombs on certain parts of it. Um, and if we think about what a conference like this can do, if your enemies are all talking to each other, helping each other out, sharing the various, whether it's um, um, artillery or um, tanks or um, you know materials of war, and you're passing them around Asia for this next wave of warfare, which is what it was, and yet again, that's been erased, um, you too, as a revolutionary fighter, need to be in contact with each other. That kind of support, that kind of knowledge, the techniques that were working, what was happening in Vietnam at this moment was absolutely critical. The failures of the Indian um, and what became East and West Pakistan in 1947, what failed there? The negotiations that were happening in Indonesia were around money. Who held financial control after independence? That became a key question, not so much in this conference, which, as you say, was much more about strategy, but it was a conundrum that was asked in the other conferences that these same women were going to. How do we think about financial imperialism in this moment after the end of World War II? And so they met and they were strategizing. There were two sets of strategies. One was for women of Asia, which is to say we have slightly different struggles. We have to support each other as much as possible. So it was sort of um, a tensile solidarity that, that allowed each struggle to take, take the, the path that it needed to take, whether it was in Indonesia or in the Philippines, which that delegation wasn't allowed to come. The Japanese delegation was barred by the MacArthur government from coming. So you can see even still they're communicating with each other. But this is a time when that communication is utterly blocked by colonial powers. Unless they get to the conference, it's very hard to hash out the differences and develop an overarching strategy. So the two-part strategy to fight fascism was one part was from within, and that could take slightly different shapes depending whether you were in Malaya or whether you were in um, Indonesia, or whether you were in Thailand. Um, but the other part was that there, in, in imperialism, in fascism, the lead has to be taken from within colonized countries. The, the role of leader has to come from there. Those within colonizing countries are in a support role, but they have to take a side. The, the danger is different, um, but, but it can't just be signing a petition. You have to put your, um, you have to put your whole body into the struggle. So in the case of the Dutch women, um, their fight against Indone the Indonesian imperialist war led by the Dutch was to lay down on the ground in front of the, um, uh, the barges that were being filled with weaponry. Um, they were attacking the British envoy to um, the Netherlands in 1947 because they knew he was sharing military operations with and, and planning um, military operations with the, the Dutch officials. So they attacked him as he was coming on the street um, and they were beaten and bludgeoned and arrested. And the theory was you can't stand back. It's not enough to say, oh, we support you from afar. The actual machinations of war are happening in Europe, are happening in the United States. So this is the, the, the essence of the strategy was take leadership from colonized, the women of colonized countries um, and put it into place where you are. It, when you say it out loud, it sounds like something we should have always known um, or maybe always did know. And why suppress something that's so obvious? Um, and, yet, and yet it very clearly was.
And also, I want to emphasize, in addition to the sort of layered nuance of the strategy, it's an explicitly anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist women's movement, a movement led by women, about women, but directly and explicitly tied to colonialism, which means that you can't, if you're that kind of women's movement, not be thinking about issues that are very vital and very important to women everywhere. I mean, there's a universality of women's oppression in terms of the social oppression of women in all parts of the world, in the colonized world and in the colonizing parts of the world. But the argument here, it seems to me, and from, from what I'm getting from your book, is that the women in the imperialist core in Europe, in the United States, while fighting against the social oppression of women in all of its manifestations, it also had to have a politically explicit anti-colonial, anti-imperialist element that wasn't just sort of part of the movement, it was central to the movement. That's exactly right. And this is where the language of peace came in. So there was a fight at this conference and Laila Saripnu, who was coming from Indonesia, was was not in favor of using the language of peace. She wanted the anti-imperialism and the language of anti-imperialism to be absolutely explicit. Um, and they, they kept a lot of that language. But what developed in 1949, this emerged in 1948 when they met, but it, it really solidified in 1949 that the language of peace was a language of anti-imperialism. So, so while peace sounds like a a simple goal or a idealistic goal. In fact, it was a deep, the, the articulation of peace as a political goal and as a strategy was deeply anti-imperialist. And that was part of what was happening at this conference was um, uh, putting meat into a term that, that had previously been a kind of, uh, kind of like a, like a, like a nice goal or, or something that might well happen. If the analysis of imperialism is that it, it is driven to war, it is driven to conquest, to aggression, then peace suddenly takes a different weight. Um, and that was one of the debates that they'd been having over the year when they met in person. And what's so interesting is these fights, from what I can tell, from the written records, the letters, et cetera, none of this happened in the written record. It had to happen at these conferences, in part because of colonial suppression of radical movements, particularly communist movements, but also because of the difficulty of these issues. It's, it's a terrible analogy, but it's like email. You can't have a complexity of tone in written word. You need the face-to-face -face debate over how to do this delicate work, how to craft a strategy that can withstand the virulence of the anti-communism that they could see coming from a mile away. Yeah, I want to I want to stay with this for one more moment here. Uh, just again, again, for people who are watching our show for the first time or listening to the show for the first time, and who are new to these kind of politics, I want to just help frame it a little bit more and then get your reaction. You know, in World War I, the major imperialist powers went to war against each other. They were basically fighting each other for who was going to control Africa and Asia and Latin America and the Middle East. There was a war uh, between the imperialists for the division or redivision of, of world markets and world colonies. And then it kind of repeated itself with World War II, except with the addition that the Soviet Union, a socialist country and a major power, and not an imperialist country was also a major force and perhaps the dominant force in the defeat of fascism. I not, not perhaps, I mean, absolutely. But then after World War II, the struggle about war and peace actually changes in a, in a fundamental way because all of the imperialists who are fighting each other in World War I and World War II come together in a united front against the common foe, and the common foe in this case is communism or socialism, the rising socialist countries and the ex-colonies or colonies who are trying to become non-colonies, the national liberation movements, who are looking to uh, 
Soviet Union and China to the socialist camp for aid and assistance, uh, for solidarity. And so the war, the struggle between war and peace shifts after World War II, and it, and it really is, in a way, a kind of a global class war. All the imperialists are together, and all of the socialist countries are together on the other side, and with them are those people struggling against colonialism. So the movement for peace after World War II also become, reflects this new reality, this new change in, the in what war looks like. And so it has to have, a, pacifism alone doesn't do it. Uh, opposing peace because it's, because it's, opposing war because it's the absence of peace doesn't do it. Now, what, what this book is showing us is that to struggle for peace is really to embrace the fight against colonialism, which all the imperialists are trying to stop, the, the movement uh, to eradicate colonialism. So a different world, a new kind of stage of imperialism and a new stage for movements for social change. I think you're right. And there's one additional element. If you look at the, the genocide of anti-Semitism in Europe, if you look at the pervasiveness of lynching, Jim Crow segregation, um, racial terror in the United States, these linkages by 1945 were utterly unavoidable. And when you look at the formation of the Women's International Democratic Federation in 1945 in Paris, immediately the, 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 the WIDF was formed around anti-fascism, the fight against the anti-Semitism of the, the end of World War II, and to say we're not done yet, right? The Vichy government had fully embraced an anti-Semitic uh, language, anti-Roma language, a racialized, oppressive language of the fascist regime. And that internal contradiction, I think, is another difference in World War II, that, that, there, that the divisions from within imperialist countries, the, um, the erasure, the um, eradication of populations within imperialist powers showed the complexity of how domination works. And I think it's, it might be why it was a women's movement that took the forefront, because so often we think of the Bandung Conference in 1955. These women, these communist women, were picking up much early, six years earlier, much more radical, right? Less of a nationalist liberation movement, which had a whole series, some socialists, some, some not so much, more nationalist bourgeoisie. But they were taking the cutting edge precisely because they were able to show that imperialism is rent from within. Imperialism is broken. Imperialism breaks itself, eats its young, in a sense, from within. And those kinds of solidarities, rather than a simple block of location of countries and their relationship to colonialism, when you talk about imperialism, you have to ask about the oppressed from within and the the genocidal oppression from within, alongside those dominant strands which allow that to work, whether it's um, the racial identity, caste identity, gender identity, sexual identity of the people from within as well as from without. So it's re it's refusing the logic of us versus them or, or Euro-America versus um, the colonized world and saying, actually, there are seams of fascism within these European countries that affect its own populations. And I think that's where the brilliance of their strategy is comes out. Very, very important. So um, again, read this book, everyone, um, to learn more about it. I want to I want to get I want to spend a little bit of time, not instantly, because I'm going to ask you something else, but a little bit of time about how you how you did this book because this was this was like climbing the Himalayas. This was a major <laughs> this was a major project and it took many years. And one of the one of the reasons it took so long is that the results of the conference about burying the corpse of imperial of colonialism, the conference itself in a way becomes buried. And you you mention in your book there's two I'm and I'm I might be misstating it, so correct me if I'm wrong, but at least two elements of it. One is the anti-communist uh, 
attack against a left-led, a Marxist-led, a communist-led women's movement makes it impossible, especially in imperialist countries, for people to learn this history. So there's the anti-communist suppression of this movement in terms of our own memory of it, the suppression of memory, mm -hmm. which is so important. But there's another element, which is the movement itself didn't really do a great deal to advertise the outcome of the conference. And so you, in your pursuit of this conference, this forgotten conference, you know, you couldn't easily go to the archives of the, even the different left women's organizations and say, oh, here's all the declarations, here's the resolutions, here it all is, I just, you know, it's all here, it's all curated, I just have to write about it. You had to, deep, you had to dig deeply to find it. And, and I want to read a little bit to you and to our audience from your introduction. The 1949 Asian Women's Conference resolutions, appeals, and discussions were not disseminated widely. That is, they did not become propaganda, and propaganda in a positive sense, or information put in the hands of as many women as possible. This omission of information is particularly strange since delegates of the Asian Women's Conference and members of the WIDF as a whole sought to shape a women's movement that spanned the world. Instead, the political theories of women's internationalist activism developed at the AWC, the Asian Women's Conference, were communicated to audiences in a couple of different shorthands. Anyway, what happened? So there's, okay, so let me, I think there's two stories. After the conference, the women who went to the, to the conference spread out, they wrote widely, they traveled across their regions, they talked about the conference, what they discovered. So at an immediate level, it was absolutely disseminated widely, but it was more in left-wing presses, in newspapers, at these gatherings, like all over Great Britain were these small gatherings that the um, Marion Ramelson, who went to the conference, did. So there was that kind of um, grassroots mass uh, um, uh, iteration of what happened at the conference. Um, but, but the resolutions, they did not, um, um, WIDF did not, there's only a few locations that I've seen these resolutions repeated. One is their um, own journal, um, the bulletin, um, and maybe a little bit of the literature, but not very much. And you're right, I had to go, um, I spent a lot of time in different parts of the world talking to communist women, talking to the women's organizations and looking in whatever archives they had. So in the case, I actually heard about this. Um, the first time I heard about it was, I think it's revealing, was in Hadra Begum, who was a very important communist women leader in India. She had an oral uh, um, history done in, it was held in the um, Teen Murthy Library in New Delhi. So I, I read through this oral history, it was transcribed, and she talks about um, WIDF. I start looking through the archival materials, a few more, they get released um, every few years and some new materials had come up at that time. And I was starting to read the debate within India in this period in 1948-49, where they were, they were fighting it out in the women's movement, whether or not they wanted to have an affiliation with them, whether or not they were too communist. So Hadra Begum as a communist said, absolutely, we want an affiliation. And she maintained one throughout her life um, with the NFIW, the National Federation of Indian Women. So that was my first glimmer um, of the WIDF. And of course, it caught my eye and my curiosity. Um, and I immediately went to the NFIW. I interviewed Primula Lumba, who is now passed away, but um, she was a WIDF uh, representative of India and lived in Berlin when the headquarters moved there in the early 1960s. Um, and what she told me, and then I went to the NFIW um, headquarters in New Delhi, and they said, we burned our records every five years. And that, for me, is an, an, an explanation of sorts, which is it was not safe to keep your own records. So the NFIW doesn't have extensive records. I've since met with other party members. It tends to be held in households. 
um, in your own, maybe in regional areas, but not at a national level, not in a single location. So what I started doing is just going woman by woman by woman who was part of the communist movement around the world and asking them either what they remembered or who I might talk to or re what records they might have. And there was very little, but um, so I spent a lot of time in the um, uh, in Beirut uh, talking with organizers there and three women from the region, two women from Syria, and one woman from Lebanon went. Um, I found nothing on any of them. I did find um, some materials on communist women organizing in Lebanon in the southern region. Um, the tobacco workers were organized by the communists. Um, they were all women. So it was that, I think what I learned was, as I it took me a long time, more than 10 years, um, what I learned is that repression is the real story, whether of your own livelihood, of your capacity to work, of your ability to stay out of jail. Um, this is a story of the loss of records by a global repression at a very local material level, as well as at a national level, and thus at an archival level. Okay, I wanna just quick follow up. So was, was it for, as the, as the post-World War II, Cold War, as we call it, misnamed Cold War, uh, continues in, with the very hot war in Korea, a quarter of the Korean population is killed. That's according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, by the way, in 1967. Wow. One out of four or one out of five Koreans died. Uh, wow. Certainly a death toll of genocidal proportions. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the world was facing the threat of thermonuclear conflict between the USSR and the US. And, and even in 1962, uh, an event I actually remember as a child, it almost came to that with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Was the shift in the world communist movement strategy to try to bring in broader sectors of society, say in a, some sort of popular front against the danger of war, the danger of nuclear war, did it, in other words, bringing in more people who are anti-communist or non-communist liberals who don't seem to exist anymore as a species in America, the doves have died, uh, but they didn't, they were a very important part of society, was there sort of a, a shift away from that explicitly anti-colonial, anti-imperialist sort of language such that it would draw in more center elements perhaps? I mean, was that part of what happened? Um, I would say no. It, uh, I think what happened was Maybe the language shifted, the politics did not. Um, and even the language, when you read through the materials in the 1950s, and the, I mean, the sheer courage of the group of 16 women from the WIDF who um, went in May of 1951 and toured the devastation in Korea, and then produced, they were from, I think it was 21 women from 17 different countries, they produced this report, which was an absolute bombshell. I mean, the courage of doing that, there was no other group that was visiting at that early in 1951. It did happen later. Um, so that, I'm, that refusal to step back from danger, to me, is the hallmark of all of the WIDF's organizing in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, they were taking extremely courageous anti-imperialist positions. So I am looking forward to, to, to activists and scholars telling these stories. I think I've chosen one in 1949 at the beginning of this organization. If you were to go to 1961, I think you could find similar stories. We don't have them well documented, but my my sense is that they exist. Um, they didn't step back from the politics that emerged from this conference, which is what makes it so interesting. So not only did they, they not talk about it that much, nothing about what was resolved at this conference disappeared. It became a kind of hidden backbone of the organization for decades to come. Very, very interesting.
And the and just for again for our audience, the com the delegation that went from WIDF to to Korea during the Korean War, which by itself. That's a pretty gutsy move to go to the Korean War, where the main complaint of U.S. pilots was there was nothing left to bomb because they had carpet bombed the entire country so completely by the end of 1950 that they said there's nothing left to bomb. There wasn't one structure in, in North Korea taller than one story still standing by 1951, yeah. and they bombed it for two more years. So to send a delegation under those circumstances is extremely heroic. But what they were documenting, if I'm correct, Dr. Armstrong, is the, I might be wrong here, but is the use of biological and chemical weapons by the United States. I know there was a delegation, I think of women, maybe it was the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom that did this, but there was mm. a study done, and it was women who uncovered the fact that the U.S. was using these weapons of mass destruction against Korean civilians. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the WI. LPF, but I know for certain in May of 1951, that's precisely what the WIDF delegation of women found. And um, it got, it made its way into the UN. They were seeking um, hu um, human rights violations by the US Army for the devastation and for the, specifically for the use of chemical weaponry, which later reemerged in, as we know, in Vietnam. So the, the story of Korea and the tactics used, that scorched earth um, tactics that were used in 1950 through 1953 were, were used again. So this became a, a method um, of, of uh, taking out an entire country. And you're right, when they got there in May of 1951, Every single day they had to stay under in protective cover because the areas that they were inspecting were filled with mass graves. There was almost nobody left, but they were still being bombed. They were still being carpet bombed while they were doing their inspection. Incredible. And uh, there's a scholar who has a book coming out. I don't know if this is kosher on a, in a show that, that's talking about one book, but it's coming out at the end of this year by Susie Kim. And she has a copy of the film. So we know of the publication um, called We Accuse. Um, but there is a film that she found in Russia um, in the Garf archives of um, that they took of the uh, expedition that they, they made in 1951. And it is horrific. So that the stills that come out in that in that uh, published um, uh, brochure pamphlet um, documentation that they made um, is in in moving um, uh, documentation in this movie. Um, so so what they were able to do is put on the map, make visible, again, that question of visibility, um, a war that nobody wanted to talk about and a war that nobody wanted to think about what was actually happening. They made it absolutely tangible, refused to let it be hidden. Yeah. And it's so, you know, nobody thinks of the Vietnam War as the forgotten war because we can't forget it. But the reason we can't forget it is not only did the U.S., lose the war, but millions of Americans were in the streets every day uh, protesting against the war in Vietnam, where the time period that we're talking about, 1949, 1950, 51, 52, you have the arrest and then execution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were anti-war mm -hmm. activists, uh, mm -hmm. the suppression of not just left and communist forces, but anyone associated with a peace movement during the Korean War was branded as, as a leftist or a communist. And people at that time were worried about going to jail. They were worried about losing their jobs. They were afraid to sign petitions even because mm -hmm. if the U.S. Peace Council issued the petition or some peace organization that the House of Un-American Activities Committee would say was a front for the communist movement, you know, you'd be branded. So it's forgotten because yeah. it, it was suppressed. It wasn't, it didn't just get like we put it somewhere and we forgot about it. So one mm -hmm. of the important parts of your book and one of the important parts of this endeavor, this larger endeavor of storytelling is to help us restore our memory or bring to our memory things that we never knew about. And the, the idea of memory is so important. Uh, and the idea of how ideas are shaped and consciousness is formed. If people think they're starting from scratch, if they don't know 
our own history, the history of our people's movements here and globally, it's such a deficit because it's kind of, it is like starting from scratch and you don't know, you haven't learned the lessons of history. You know, there's that cliche that said, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Well, those who don't know history are also in a way doomed not to repeat it because there's parts of history that are definitely need to be repeated, like the struggle yeah. for justice and equality and against war and for, in this case, for socialism. So yeah. I really salute you. Uh, and I want to just, let's say somebody's listening to this show and they're hearing you and you're saying, I hope I meet other people who are want to tell the stories from 1961 or so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It seems like people need to find each other. The people who yeah. want to tell and that's stories. Been, Just talk about that. That's Yeah, and that's been really the the most fun. Um, I, it did take a long time to pull this together, but in the process, I got to know other, some were more public historians, um, uh, sort of public intellectuals who were telling these stories. So a lot of the material that I learned about Lila Saripno, who was living in Amsterdam during German occupation, um, and she was taking on fascist occupation every single day. At the same time, she was fighting Dutch colonialism, right? So that duality of the, the work that she was doing, um, I learned from other people and I would just reach out to everyone. The people, I've, I've been in people's attics going through materials that they have in boxes. Um, the generosity of people in doing this work, I don't think I've ever done a project at quite this level because there's a common feeling of we have to know this. And I feel like one of the, the major movement questions that we're facing today on the left is how do we build a capacious unity? How do we build a unity, um, a working class, peasant, people's movement that maintains the complexity of all of the different people who are part of it and their histories and their struggles, but holds together as a unified left communist movement. And I think this is a story that we need to know. To imagine how to do that difficult work and joyous work. Um, and I think that's something that I, I hope to bring out is how silly some of these activists were in their off time. So Gita Bandiopatai, who was a, a Bengali activist who was living in Paris and then had, you know, they were thrown out of Paris because of one of their members, Jeanette Vermeer, stands up in 1950. She was a French parliamentarian, Communist Party uh, member. And she stands up and she says, this is not a just, the, the French occupation of Vietnam is not a just war. They are fighting. That is just fighting. They are fighting for their independence, for their sovereignty. And by saying that in French pol uh, parliament, um, and that and other, uh, uh, Eugene, Eugenie Cotton ripping up, um, enlistment papers and saying that mothers should not allow their sons to be enlisted to fight in France. Um, made the WIDF uh, um, just forbidden in France, and they had to move to Berlin. And so while all of these, these terrible things are happening and this kind of repression is happening, the sense of humor of these activists, their sense of fun, their willingness to um, learn each other's languages comes out a lot in, in the journals that I read. Um, the kind of joking, the the way that they see humor in the difficulties of their lives, I think this is all a piece of this story of how do we how do we build a movement as multiplicitous as a movement against a global movement of women against imperialism that holds the joy of living, that holds the humor of the situations we're in, as well as facing the tragedy and the repression. And I think if there's one thing that I want um, to live in this book. It's that um, Very because good. it came up every, every single time. Well, for our part here at the Socialist Program, we're, we're not producing this content because it's interesting. We're producing this content because uh, we want to help people who want to change the world like we want to change the world to have tools to be able to do that. And certainly uh, having this kind of history, this kind of memory, and then the the collective values that you're articulating, which is people are fighting together, but they're not only fighting together, they're also uh, living together and they're enjoying 
living together. Uh, it's about building a movement, a comprehensive movement, uh, exactly what you're saying. Uh, Professor Armstrong, the book is published by University of California Press. I'm going to hold it up so people can see it one more time. And the name of the book is Bury the Corpse of Colonialism, the Revolutionary Feminist Conference of 1949. Dr. Armstrong, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.